Hello and welcome back to another episode of A Method to the Madness, our Breaking Bad edition. I'm your host, Mitchie, and joining me as usual is Patrick. Hello. And this week we're covering Season 3, Episode 10, uh, titled Fly. This one's a pretty infamous episode from if, if you've actually listened to uh, any of our previous podcasts on Breaking Bad, because well, up to before watching this episode, I actually heavily detested this. But Ooh. now that I've watched it again... I actually really like it. Yeah. In fact, it might be one of my favorite episodes. Yeah, that's what I like to hear. <laughs> Even though it's directed by Ryan Johnson. <laughs> but anyway, as any, everyone should know, this episode's about Walt having an obsession with trying to sort out a fly in the lab. Mm. But we'll see that it has a lot more deeper implications than that. Anyway, let's go through the plot, please, Pat. All right. Walt, suffering from insomnia, stares up at his smoke detector's flashing light while trying to get back to sleep. Later, he arrives with Jesse at the super lab, where they begin making an, another batch of meth. At the end of the day, Walt calculates that their yield, while above what they are required to produce, falls short of what he expects. Jesse, who has been secretly taking small amounts for personal distribution, suggests it may be from other losses from spillage, but Walt insists there is another reason. After Jesse leaves for the day, Walt sees a house fly in the lab which he fears could contaminate the meth-making process. He tries numerous means to spot it, even dangling precariously from the lab's catwalk, from which he slips and falls to the floor. When Jesse returns the next day, he finds Walt still in pain from the fall and demanding that they cannot start cooking until they get rid of the fly. Jesse gets some fly paper which they hang around the lab, as well as some sleeping pills that he secretly puts into Walt's coffee. He then recounts a story about his late aunt, who experienced auditory hallucinations as a result of her cancer spreading to her brain. As they wait to catch the fly, the two talk about their families. Walt expresses that he should have died already and tries to think of the perfect moment to have done so. After he had enough money, after Holly was born, before his surgery, and before Skylar knew what he'd been doing. He finally decides the perfect moment to die would have been the night Jane died, telling Jesse of his conversation with her father, with her father Donald. Jesse is distracted when he sees the fly near the ceiling. As he tries to use the stepladder to reach the fly, an increasingly sleepy Walt seems poised to confess to Jesse about his role in Jane's death. Jesse tells him Jane's death was nobody's fault, but he still misses her. Jesse climbs back down, and seeing the fly land on the ladder, swats and kills it. Jesse takes a sleeping Walt to a couch while he cleans up the super lab and prepares for the next batch. They later leave together, but Walt warns Jesse that if he has been skimming from their product, he will not be able to protect him if Gus finds out. That night, Walt is awakened by buzzing and sees a fly landing on the smoke detector's flashing light. All right. We went through the whole plot because, I mean, there's nothing. It's all one story, right? One. Yeah, one, like, uh, there, there yeah. are beats, but it's not. they're not events or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, well, the reason why I didn't like this episode to begin with is because... What even happens in this, really? Ostensibly not much in terms of actual plot, I guess, and ignoring anything like character development or stuff like that. And literally nothing happens in this. I mean, they're just trying to hunt down this fly in the lab. Um, but, you know, it, that's it. But then you kind of realize that, you know, the development between Walt and Jesse is really interesting, and in particular Walt, like what, what he's thinking about and what, what he, the kind of thought processes that he has. It's very interesting. I mean, what do you think of this episode, Pat? I don't know. I didn't when I first watched it. I didn't really think much of it. I don't think, but on my on subsequent viewings, I, I really love this episode. Mm. I think episodes like the like these in TV shows are what I don't know. It's kind of all about. I you know these kind of like contemplative episodes where it just takes a moment to really introspect and you know like plot. You know, does a lot of, for like social commentary like for example like you know the the fact that he gets cancer and can't pay for it is a critique of the american healthcare system but yep. like on a on a much deeper level you know the show is about like ambition and like insecurity mm. and you know these real like complex human emotions and then mm. it's episodes like these that really fucking delve deep into that shit you know yeah 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 a lot of tv shows do this i feel and you know those are like my favorite episodes Okay, yeah. One of my one of my favorite anime series is well, actually, there's there's a few is uh, Cowboy Bebop and Samurai Champloo, both by uh, the same director Shinichiro Watanabe, and uh, those shows have like so many moments where like the characters are just like kind of sitting down, like looking at a sunset or like a or something like that, mm. and you know, there's like there's kind of no music, just like ambient, like wind blowing sounds, and they won't speak for like you know a good ten or fifteen seconds, and it's it's shit like that, like that kind of ennui, uh, melancholy, just like kind of reflecting on life is like, <clears throat> I think that, that's that's my favorite kind of art, and so this episode yeah. really strikes a chord with me. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes the it's a lack of action that makes it actually seem deep, and it truly is deeper. 
really. Yeah. When you have too much shit going on, it's hard to interpret anything yeah. meaningfully. And you, so what do you think it's about then? Mainly it's about like regret. Like, I don't know. I, I say regret, but it's it's about like Walter finally actually realizing, like fully comprehending his position in life and like what he's done and where he is at right now. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think that I think that all... <clears throat> that culminates in the moment where he muses on the perfect moment to die, and yeah. you know that's a that's a, he's thinking about that. He's really lost in that thought because the the dire situation that he finds himself in that he, he yeah he's actually stopping to think about now, and yeah, um, I don't know. I feel like great this this perfect moment that he's musing on. It's a really great connection to his motivations at the start of the series, where yeah, it, it, it was all planned because he he knew he was going to die from cancer and now he's he's not going to anymore he's in remission yeah um and so it's i don't know it's just you know like the show accelerates and meanders a lot it goes to a lot of different places and then this just brings it back to where it all started and like i don't know i just think it's really good yeah but yeah. sorry what, what was what was the original question oh like what i mean what what do you in, what do you interpret from all this, this oh episode? right yeah 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 so because like this is in season three, the middle season, and you know it's not it's not the middle episode, but kind of close to it. Like I don't know this is kind of in the middle of the series as a whole, mm. and it's just like a really good like it's it's just bringing it back around to like kind of what the show is at its core. Yeah. Okay. One one bit I like I, I find particularly important in this episode is Walt's kind of acceptance of well not acceptance but he kind of turns for a second there away from science and he becomes a man of like. Yeah, 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 you know, like, me- like mysticism. Yeah, yeah, mysticism and cosmicism, mm. really, ac- and quite literally, because you know he says he tries to calculate the probability of meeting Donald on that life and uh, on that night. Sorry, and it's in, you know it's just improbable. It shouldn't have happened and stuff. And then he says like literally like like wh- what does that even mean? Think of the odds. What does it, what is it saying for me? You know that kind of thing because he knows that later on that night he does end up inadvertently killing Jane. And to meet her dad beforehand in that random bar in Albuquerque, anywhere, is just so unlikely. And and I think for him as a character, that's quite important where he's just so scientific, you know, and everything has to make sense and everything has some sort of logic. And yet, he, and he even he says that in this episode, he's like, oh, you know, the universe is a bunch of subatomic particles just smashing in each other. There, it's just chaos and there is no meaning. And then, but he seems to append some sort of meaning to meeting Donald in that bar. Mm-hmm. And that's a very different thing, different kind of uh, a viewpoint from what that we're used to. Yeah, I, I think this is the the show's like fatalism themes that in its most potent. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, he he says like you know he tried calculating it once. How would you go about calculating that? You can do it. I've I've. It's like some people do this kind of shit. You know, they just calculate the probability of pretty random things and. You got to make a lot of assumptions and work out an equation. Yeah. You can do it. Like like people like estimate what's the probability that aliens will land on this planet within the next hundred years, and then you have to work out from the number of stars and viable planets out in the universe and stuff like that. And then you get a number. You're like one in ten billion or some shit. You know, like it, it, it's possible. It's very difficult, yeah. and also, yeah, obviously, it could be very wrong too. I was just thinking about like all the variables. Like, okay, so he'd have to take into account how often Walt goes to a bar, how many yeah. people there are in Albuquerque, Albuquerque, how often that dude probably went to that bar. Yeah. Um. You know, like the 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 amount of hours in a day, like shit, like that. Like. Yeah. Comparatively, yeah. I don't think it'd be that difficult. Actually, that's probably one of the more easier things to do. But the number itself would be very low. I think at this yeah. point, right? Like. Yeah. It's yeah, it's yeah. it's very unlikely. Yeah. But yeah, I. One thing that stood out to me in this episode was, yeah, he's staying awake and he, he's going, he's slightly insane in this. And why is he like that, right? Like at the start of the episode, we see that he can't sleep and he's looking at the fire alarm and then he goes to work and stuff, right? And and part of me thinks that like, like there's some sort of existential kind of undertones to all this. It's that it's, it's sort of like Walt has been living his life and he's been quite unsatisfied, right? And, and you know, at some point you'd probably, if you were in his position, you'd, we all do it at some point in our lives anyway, but you just end up questioning like, why am I living and what am I doing? And for him to break bad from 
uh, his teacher role after he found out he had cancer and to to start cooking meth, you know, this signifies a big change in his life and some sort of excitement and maybe gives him some purpose. But then he ends up in this place that Gus offers him in this super lab where all he does is is just work a nine to five job where yeah. he's breaking the law cooking meth, but it's still a nine to five job just like he was as a school teacher. And for me, I feel like maybe he's just kind of realizing like, well, you know, I, I made these efforts to do all these like illegal things and stuff for some excitement, but look where I am now. I'm in a position that's no different to what I was like a year ago when I was a teacher. Mm. What am I really doing? You know, you know, it might not be exactly um, what what is thinking, but that is my interpretation of what's going on. Right. That, so he he again speaking to like you know uh, his sort of like mystic view on fate. Yeah. Again, he's like it's as if he's stuck in some cyclic you know purgatory. Just like going from one, yeah, nine to five to another. Yeah, exactly. Which is what we all do. Yeah, you know, that's just, and and I think that's kind of what it what it stands for, really. And right. and the fly in that way is, um, I don't know, maybe it, it's like it's like this little bother to him, right? Like it's always buzzing around his head, and it's just there out of sight, and it's it's this little pain, but it's not dangerous in any way, not even pernicious or anything like that. It's just this thing that's an, it's an annoyance, but it's always there. And mm. maybe it's something, I mean, that, that is what we, every human kind of realizes to some degree is that there is this little annoyance in the back of our head. And that annoyance is, is like, well, why, why do we do what we do? What, what is the purpose of what we're doing on this planet? You know? And, and right. maybe that's what that fly represents. That Yeah. That's interesting. I like that, that the fly is some, manifestation of walter's existential insecurity and all of ours yeah yeah well yeah i mean you know it it also works on like like you know not just insecurity in general about like because walt has such a pedantic nature yeah and just like you know as he says like this fly is a problem in this highly controlled environment and it's because the meth cooking is the one thing he could control versus you know, the fact that he was an underachiever in sort of all aspects of his life, you know, he's working as a teacher instead of like a, as an expert chemist. Yeah. Um, he, you know, he doesn't make a lot of money. His, his son has cerebral palsy, stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. There's a, there's a great line <laughs> when Jesse's trying to put the, like some sodium hydroxide in the thing. Yeah. And then <laughs> Walt says, no, it's like, I order you to not do that. And he's like, you can't order shit, Adolf. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's his second Hitler reference <laughs> against Is Walt. It? Yeah, yeah. In like the first episode or the second episode, he's like, like, hi, Hitler, bitch. And then, you know, because Walt's uh, like ordering him around. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, the interaction between those two are very good. It's very in- enjoyable too. So it actually kind of it, it at least makes the episode also very entertaining, I think. And it's there's some really great development between uh, Jesse and Walt as well. Yeah, there is. And, like, I, I love how, you know, they have, like, a really genuine moment when they're talking about Jane. Yeah. And then the next scene where they're, like, leaving, you know, they just go straight back to kind of being on bad terms. Yeah. Because, you know, that's just how it goes between these two people. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's it's, an, it's yeah. frustrating, isn't it? You're just watching. Yeah, yeah. You want them to be really good friends and they just never are at any point. Mm. Although, although, I feel like Jesse was being a dick at this ep- end of this episode. I mean, Walt's just simply... St- st- you know, he's savvy enough to realize that Jesse's probably stealing that meth and he's just trying to protect him, that's all. And then Walt's like, yeah. uh, Jesse's denying it and saying, I don't need protection, blah, blah, blah. And it's like... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you know how Jesse drugs Walt? What do, you, what, do you, what do you think of that? Is that like, was that a bad thing to do? Yeah, it's a weird thing to do, isn't it? No, I, <laughs> yeah. I really like Jesse in this episode how he truly does care for Walt. Yeah. You know, every everything he's doing is trying to make like he he pretty much tacks onto the fact that Walt is just having this weird fucking like I don't know, brief moment of insanity. Mm. And rather than just being a dick about it and being like you're fucking stupid, you're going crazy, he actually tries to ve- take a very like tactful approach to actually dealing with it, i.e. by drugging him which sort of validates exactly what's going on i mean well, you can't exactly call an ambulance to a meth lab can you and like and also the fact that he's trying to imply this story through his art which you know is a little bit naive but and what obviously sees right through it but it's still kind of what jesse's like good intentions to kind of make him realize oh maybe you're kind of like you know being a little crazy right now i really like jesse in this right yeah yeah he tries to get on walt's level um yeah 
and then yeah that that very like paper thin uh uh story about jesse's aunt (laughs) so what 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 was what was the takeaway from that what is that he was comparing uh the jesse's insane aunt to walt and how he's acting but he he goes into a lot of detail about the possum how he's like oh it just stays it just stays still and it thinks it's fooling you yeah so what you know is that does that equate to anything is the possum also walt in the fact that like he walt has so much has so many secrets and so like he lies constantly and he he thinks he's you know on top or he he did think he was on top of the world yeah maybe i yeah I, I felt like more like the de- the amount of detail he went into the story was because Jesse was just having a reminiscent moment of, of his aunt, which he obviously has very strong emotions for. And he, you know, we've, we've heard about this aunt a lot and, and it kind of ties in well with the whole Jane aspect too, that, you know, he's lost people in his life and, and he's just having a contemplative mm-hmm. moment about it, I guess. So part, part, part of that, your story was obviously to signify to Walt, maybe you're going crazy and just to help Walt out. But I think, um, and the other half of the story is more for Jesse's sake. Like he just wanted to tell a story about his aunt because maybe he misses his aunt, just like right. he misses Jane. <laughs> I, I was with Walt in that moment where <laughs> Jesse's, I don't know, he's just talking about some shit, and he's like, "Is there a point to this story that you're gonna reach sometime <laughs> soon?" I was like, "Fuck yes, nah, Walt." <laughs> I, 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 you know, I'm people like, love t- love telling stories. You got to give them a chance. It only went on for like a minute. Yeah, I fucking hate when people digress though. Like just. I don't know, man. <laughs> I I'm completely with Walt in uh, making Jesse tell that only tell yeah, the pertinent points of that story. We all digress. Yeah, true. Yeah, we have a whole collection of it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, there's one more thing I want to talk about. How like he's, you know, they're talking about Jane, and then he says it's it's no one's fault. We are who we are. Yeah. Which and you know that's that's so deeply ironic because. It's it's such a struggle that Jesse had to work through to you know to convince himself that like it wasn't my fault, it wasn't Jane's fault, it was no mm. one's fault. When in reality, it kind of was Walter's fault, <laughs> you it, know. It, yeah, of course, Jane's death and, was and, yeah. Yeah, and he's confiding in Walter about this this revelation that he's had. You know, that's I suppose has brought him some semblance of you know tranquility. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's just really dark, really ironic. Like, yeah, it is pretty shit. Yeah. It? yeah, it's yeah. not nice at all. I agree. Well, that's just the kind of person Walt is. He does apologize, though, so he's all good. Yeah, not that, in he, the he right way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's all I had. It's a very good ad. Uh, yeah, same. Yeah, yeah. I've changed Great my ad. mind completely. I'm glad to hear that. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've, yeah, I, I really like this episode. Yeah, it's good. All right, uh, join us next time for episode 11. All right, see you later. Bye. Of course, I, I didn't know it at the time. I mean, he was just some guy in a bar. And I just, I didn't put it together until after the crash when he was all over the news. Jane's dad. I think of the odds. Once I tried to calculate them, but they're astronomical. I mean, think of the odds of me going and sitting down that night in that bar next to that man. The universe is random. It's it's not inevitable. It's simple chaos. It's it's subatomic particles and endless, aimless collision. That's what science teaches us. But what is this saying? If you like this series, Mitch is going to tell you where you can find more of these. Yep, so you can find us on Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, SoundCloud or Stitcher. And we've also got a website, amtgm.com, where you can find our fabulous episodes on Breaking Bad. If you have any questions, queries, insights or criticism, you can send them to mail at amtgm.com. And as always, thank you for listening.